Well, is the NFL more concerned with ending racism or ending their public relations nightmare? Well, we'll go back to one of my mother's old sayings. Actions speak a lot louder than words. Good evening, I'm Leland Vitter. Things went downhill fast after the show for Las Vegas Raiders head coach John Gruden. And his resignation is forcing the NFL to face questions it's tried hard over the years to avoid. First to Gruden himself. We talked about this last night. He apologized over the weekend for racist dog whistles and emails about a decade ago. Last night on the program, Robert Patillo made an important point. He wasn't going to volunteer this information. He wasn't going to uh, talk about this at any point. He's not mad that it happened. He's mad that it came to light. Well, and, you know, few things you don't ever get caught on your first time. Uh, cheating on your wife, drunk driving, and sending obnoxious emails is probably on that list. We didn't know how right we were. As suspected, sending dumb and distasteful emails is not a one-off occurrence. Before I got home from the show, the New York Times had more Gruden emails, including ones calling... NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell, a homophobic slur, which we will not repeat on television, and also shared pictures of women in various stages of undress with a friend who worked for the Washington Redskins. I say Redskins because that was the name of the team back then. Some of these emails date to 2011. They're coming to light because of an NFL investigation into the then Redskins organization for a host of misdeeds, sexual harassment, toxic work culture, and the list goes on. Gruden's emails, even though he did not work for the NFL, an NFL team, or certainly the Redskins, got swept up in that investigation. Are we really supposed to believe that Gruden and the Redskins employee he emailed are the only coaches, general managers, front office workers in the NFL who have sent racist, homophobic, or misogynistic emails over the past 10 years? Of course not. They're the only ones who recently got caught. What John Gruden did was repugnant. That's the writing of Andrew Brandt, I happen to agree. That's not in debate. But the NFL's diversion here is diabolical, focusing on the then ESPN broadcaster who wouldn't join the NFL for five more years. This case was about the Washington franchise. Gruden was sacrificed for the greater NFL owners. Good. Which brings us to the NFL's virtue signaling about such issues. The end zones say end racism. On Sunday, a number of the players have end racism or stop hate on the back of their helmets. It's one of the few approved social justice slogans allowed. That's pretty rich, coming from a multi-billion dollar league that committed one of the most blatantly racist acts in modern history. They used race as the singular deciding factor in paying black players less than white players with traumatic brain injury. Let me repeat myself. While they had signs that said end racism in the end zone, the NFL used race and only race to pay black players less in their settlements for concussions received during their playing time in the NFL. We loathe hypocrisy on this show more than just about anything else. Okay, now we go back to Mr. Gruden, or should we say Mr. Gruden's, because it's hard to imagine he is the only one. Here's Jamel Hill. Given the number of John Gruden's in this league, I just don't know um, if that's a realistic task that they're going to suddenly weed out this entire culture that has been just a part of the NFL as much as a leather football uh, for years. Yeah, but you got to start somewhere, right? Remember, Roger Goodell, the NFL commissioner, said this a year ago when talking about race and social justice. This is a really important moment for our country. Um, to address issues that need to be addressed and to fix them, to, to make the sustainable change. Okay, Mr. Commissioner, you want sustainable change? What about a search of all league and team emails for racist or homophobic slurs going back 10 years? What about a search of all coaches and general managers and maybe even owners' text messages going back five years? So far, those announcements haven't come and are unlikely to. Just look at the investigation that cost Gruden his job. Here's sports attorney Dan Lust, who'll be on the program tomorrow. His tweet, a law firm was paid to investigate Washington football team. We didn't see a single email from Dan Snyder, that's the owner, and never a written report. 
Yet all of Gruden's emails come out from an investigation he wasn't even the subject of. Strange until you remember that owners run the league. One commentator went further. Here's Pro Football Talk founder Mike Florino with our colleague Dan Abrams. The NFL, mm. I believe, wanted this out there. The NFL mm. wanted this to be known, so they handpicked Andrew Beaton of the Wall Street Journal for the first email that was dropped on Friday. I think it was deliberately leaked by the league, and then when John Gruden didn't resign and wasn't fired over the weekend, when he knew or should have known there was more stuff coming, they started leaking more. I, I believe they just don't like him. And he's been a constant irritant for the NFL. He has fought back against efforts to make the game safer, to reduce concussions, to reduce practice time. All right, we're going to get to the media's coverage of this in a minute because networks with fat NFL contracts spend considerable time today aghast at Gruden and very little time on the NFL. Here we do not have those dual loyalties. But first, the league itself, with Freddie Mitchell, former Eagles first-round draft pick, Super Bowl standout, Robert Patillo uh, is with us as well, civil rights attorney, outspoken NFL critic. Plus, we have PR consultant Evan Neerman on the NFL's incredible deflection of intention. Gentlemen, appreciate it very much. Thanks for being here. Uh, Freddie, I want to start with you. Uh, should we be talking about the racist actions of Coach uh, Gruden, or should we be talking about the NFL? Oh, man. I mean, it's just hard because personally for me, you know, I've sacrificed so much for the integrity of this league. And, uh, you know, uh, when you have a coach like Gruden that has so much power and can affect so many different players and have affect so, affected so many different players' uh, livelihood, it just it really, really, really hurts me because everybody knew who Gruden was. Uh, in 2018, before they gave him that $100 million contract, they knew who he was. And um, he just, I, I guess something just happened that nobody will ever know. And he just got punished for it. Hmm. Robert, if, if the NFL was serious about ending racism in the NFL, uh, what would they do? They would hire more black people. It seems very clear what the what the issue is that John Gruden would not have sent these emails if he thought any black person would read them. He would not have sent these emails if he thought any gay person would read them. He would not have sent these emails if he thought any woman would read them. So because it is a good old boys club, still predominantly controlled uh, by rich old white men, he felt comfortable doing this. And as I said last night, there was no point in time where there's a response email of anybody saying, oh my God, John, I can't believe you said this. This is terrible. They, they chuckled about this for for seven years. And if you don't think that this is pervasive in every single organization, we're in a league with 70% black players, but we only have, um, have a paucity of black head coaches, let alone general managers, players, uh, player personnel directors, so on and so forth, you have to understand that this is the good old boy system where you have a billion dollar industry, which is still run as a mom and pop family business, and where you have these sons of coaches getting head coaching jobs while Hall of Fame players cannot even get an internship with, the, uh, with league teams, and that the league is serious it's about what they're talking about. It's not about uh, slogans. It's not about patches on helmets. It is about actually hiring black people to be in the room. That's an important question because we all agree the NFL in the end is about money. This is what motivates these owners. Uh, Evan, do you think, uh, pardon me, Freddie, uh, do you think it is that, black, that owners are more racist than they are motivated by money and greedy and that they're overlooking more qualified African Americans because they're so racist? Oh, uh, yeah, I think the control has a lot to do with it, you know, and uh, that, that I'm glad Robert says something about that because, you know, I, I, I wanted to ask the Raiders to hire a black coach. You know, uh, you have Deuce Daly, you have Eric Bieniemy, you have a lot of guys that are qualified uh, for this job. And, you know, it's funny that, you know, Coach Gruden uh, uh, basically got handed a, a Super Bowl team by an African-American coach. But... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But nobody wants to, wants to say that. You know, uh, it's, uh, I think that money is definitely the root of all evil, but it's a deep, a deep culture of racism that is going on. And uh, it's, it just, it's, it's, it's bad. It's sad. Yeah, Evan, from a crisis standpoint, crisis PR standpoint, you sort of have to hand it to the NFL on this one, don't you? In that they leaked out these emails by Gruden and got, made this big deal about getting rid of a racist coach. Meanwhile, 
God knows what's in the other 650,000 emails from the Redskins football team. Well, that's a good point. And I think earlier you alluded to the fact that the NFL has had a litany, a long list of problems from a PR perspective for quite some time. Toxic work environment, owners misbehaving, uh, a racist name for a franchise team in the nation's capital. There's no shortage of, of issues and incidents with, with which they've had to grapple through the years. I think in this case, unfortunately for Coach Gruden, he becomes the sacrificial lamb. He becomes a way for the league to hold out an example and say, we don't tolerate, see, look, our actions speak louder than our words. And in this environment that we're in right now, where you have a confluence of internet rage, the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, real efforts to create racial equality in the country, and this cancel culture, which can turn on a dime really quickly, it can torpedo a person's career. And in this case, you know, Gruden obviously said things that are completely reprehensible. And now that they've come to light, he really left the NFL once they decided to put those things out there in the public, there was really little hope that he had of maintaining his job. And you have to imagine if you're sitting there as Gruden, you know all the emails that you send over the years, uh, and you also realize that they have a lot of them. So uh, if it wasn't the racist email or the homophobic email, you had to imagine there was worse things that uh, might have been coming. Uh, Freddie, you brought up Tony Dungy, which I thought was an interesting person to bring up, who actually commented on this Sunday night during Sunday night football before Gruden's resignation. Take a listen. It wasn't the right way to do it, but it was 10 years ago. And I'm not going to chalk everything up to racism. I think we accept his apology, move forward, and move on. It's interesting because Tony Junji was so key in Michael Vick getting a second chance after the dog fighting uh, conviction in his time in prison. You, Tony, Tony Junji might as well be the, the pastor in the church of second chances. Uh, do you think Freddie does and should Gruden get that same second chance from Tony Dungy and from the NFL that Michael Vick got? Well, I, I think that they're privy to a lot of information we don't know, and I don't know how many chances Gruden has, has gotten uh, uh, privately. Uh, I think, yes, he deserves a second chance. Uh, um, I think that, you know, his privacy was violated um, uh, somewhat. Uh, because it wasn't like he was, you know, publicly tweeting something out or, you know, on Instagram saying something. These were private information uh, with, a, with an investigation that, uh, that got leaked out. So I, I just, you know, I, I have mixed views about that. And I, I, everybody deserves a second chance. I wish I would have had a second chance, you know. Uh, well, uh, nuanced, nuance is something that's missing on cable news, and we're grateful for all of you uh, to bring that. Robert, I only got about 30 or 45 seconds left. We started this by saying that if Roger Goodell was serious, you'd search every club's email for these racist and homophobic slurs and for pictures of naked girls, and you'd actually really do something. Is that something that's possible, or is that just too big of an ask? I'm not, I'm not asking if it's having the political will to do it or the business will. I'm asking uh, from an investigation standpoint. Uh, absolutely. Anything that's on the NFL server is saved forever, and that can be undone. So remember, this was part of the Washington football team's server at the time. And I, I think the NFL has to look into this, and also the fact that people like uh, Kyle Shanahan is a coach because his dad, Mike Shanahan, was a coach. Sean McVay is a coach because his dad, McVay, was also a coach. Uh, right now, uh, Bill Belichick is grooming his son to be the next uh, NFL head coach. So we have to look at the fact that we are not having a level playing field where people like Freddie has the opportunity or Deuce Staley or Byron Leftwood or Eric B. Enemy has the chance to ascend to being a head coach if you're not the son of a previous NFL head coach. And that's the type of white privilege that we're talking about when it comes to creating an even playing field in the NFL. And if they're serious about what they're talking about, they'll hire black people. Well, we'll see if they're serious. Uh, I got a touchdown there from Freddie. Um, Evan, sorry we didn't get more time to chat. Next time we will. Gentlemen, thank you very much. We appreciate it. You're all welcome back anytime. This story certainly isn't going away. It's not going away in uh, the media either. Coverage of Gruden's resignation has dominated most major networks today. Quite a few comments caught our attention. They caught the attention of Colby Hall, who keeps a close eye on these things, founding editor at Media, producer of Dan Abrams' show here on News Nation. Uh, Colby, what struck me was the aghast nature of everyone dissecting Gruden and the lack of real teeth into the NFL. 
Well, it's a fascinating story for sure. And, uh, you know, you have to put in context that John Gruden is a t has been a towering figure at the NFL over 20 years. I mean, not only is he a Super Bowl winning coach, but he was the host. He was, he was the play-by-play, -play, or rather the color commentator for uh, Monday Night Football for a long time. So he's got a huge media career. And as a result, I think a lot of people in the media, especially like the sports and NFL media, which has suddenly become very comfortable being political over the last oh, five years or so, they were quick to point fingers. And they were quick to say that, you know, John Gruden, Keyshawn Johnson, for example, said, this is not a good guy. John Gruden, everyone knew that he was a jerk. And I think there's probably something to that. Had Gruden been, I don't know, had a better reputation within the NFL and within the media, I think his apology may have landed a little bit better. Um, but I think there's more to the story that's yet to come out. It, well, and I think uh, Dan Abrams uh, brought this to light, and certainly anybody who covers the media understands this, is that these leaks don't just happen. It's not, the Wall Street Journal doesn't just suddenly end up with confidential emails from inside a law firm that's been hired to investigate the Washington Football Club, and then three days later, after the apology, the New York Times gets a couple of emails. We know this, th these are not coincidences. No, Mike Florio, who uh, is well known, he hosts Pro Football Talk. He was on, uh, he was on with Dan Abrams' uh, Sirius XM radio show, and he, he basically suggested that uh, the NFL leaked these emails, they weaponized these emails, and, you know, I think there's more evidence that that's likely true than not. And part of it could be that Gruden is considered kind of a jerk within the industry, but, you know, there's probably, there's probably more to the story because it relates to the Washington football team. And what you, you, know, you set up the story very well at the top of the segment. You know, what, what is, is this? Are they trying to get away from another story? Or are they trying to get ahead of more stuff that's about to come out that could be worse? And the NFL is an enormous institution. And they're dealing with shifting social mores, the things that we thought were funny and acceptable jokes, you know, 20 years ago are understandably people should be held account to. Whether it's cancel culture or not, I guess it's all a matter of perspective. But you know what, there's, there's a good thing, there's a good rule, like don't be, don't share racist and homophobic yeah. emails and then you don't have to worry about being held accountable or canceled. Yeah, you, you don't have to worry about what you didn't say or what you didn't put in an email or a, a text. Exactly. Uh, Colby, uh, obviously uh, you point out that the, when the report comes out, if it ever does, about the Washington Football Club, that'll, that'll sort of shed light on so much more about what goes on in the NFL. Good talking to you, my friend. Thanks for having me. All right. Coming up, Texas Governor Greg Abbott takes on the federal government. Is this about politics or policy? We're going to go with politics. Plus, why U.S. workers are realizing it's the right time to go on strike and what it means for your cereal bowl and for your steak. A lot of other things, too. Labor strikes sound like a thing from the 70s or the 80s, but they are now sweeping the country once again. We warned you about this last week when Kellogg workers stopped making frosted flakes to walk the picket line. Now the UAW says they're going to walk off the job at John Deere plants just about 27 and a half hours from now. Researchers at Cornell are keeping track of the strikes. Right now, there are more than 286 of them happening coast to coast. And the fact is, it's only the beginning. Here's the former labor secretary. Americans are struggling to keep up with the increasing cost of living. Unemployment is low, but wages of most Americans have remained flat. At the same time, the cost of everything from child care to health care to housing has been soaring. Joining us now, economist Steve Moore, friend of the show, good friend of mine from Washington, D.C. All right, Steve, uh, why are we seeing these strikes now? Where is this feeling from labor unions of power coming from? Well, Leland, have you ever heard the word leverage? <laughs> right now, uh, workers have the leverage, right? Because there was a report that came out today from the Labor Department that found 11 million, we're now up to a, more than 11 million job openings in America. Uh, the problem for employers is finding workers. So workers do have leverage. They're, they're you know, bidding for higher wages. The unions are bidding for better you know, uh, benefits and so on. And so I wouldn't be surprised if over the course of the next you know, three to six months, you see more strikes. By the way, that's going to make the problem worse for our businesses because you, you already have this supply chain problem where prices are rising because you see, you've seen those Wouldn't, ships that can't right, get to the dock. Okay, and, and so. you can think about Kellogg, you think about John Deere who have in record profits. Isn't the easy answer just pay the workers more and 
you supply and demand, you'll get a bigger supply of workers. So for big companies, yeah. For big companies, you know, it, it's, but what worries me, Leland, is the smaller companies, a company with maybe, you know, 100 employees that don't have the big profit margins that a, uh, a Walmart might have or an Amazon might have. And that puts real hardship on these companies. Uh, I talked to Fred Smith, though, who's the chairman of uh, FedEx. Uh, they have 10,000 job openings at FedEx. And he said, look, we're very, this is an incredibly competitive industry that, uh, and we, in FedEx pays high salaries. They said, we're gonna have a hard time competing if uh, if the wages keep going up and up and up. I, look, I'm in favor of higher wages for workers, and if they can get higher wages, uh, fantastic. But I do worry about what impact this is gonna have on the supply chain yeah. with, uh, with more people striking. Well, 10,000 10, openings at FedEx does not bode well for you getting your overnight Christmas packages in time to be under the tree. Uh, you think about this, though, and, and maybe it's not just the supply chain because there's in, in leverage from workers. This is a graph of support for labor unions. The last time it was this high was 1965. Do you approve or disapprove of labor unions? We are at a now 50 or 60 year high of 68. That's different than just having open jobs and workers have leverage. Where's, where's this support coming from? Well, uh, by the way, I've not seen that survey before. Uh, I have to question it, Leland, because I know one of the, the biggest unions in the country is the teachers' unions, and their support has never been lower in American history because of what happened with the shutdown of our schools and the and the critical race theory and the things that are putting put in our schools. So, I'm a little surprised by those findings, frankly. Uh, but here's uh, well, the other I, I, I respectfully, and I, I understand yeah. questioning it. The the polling comes from Gallup. Okay. Um, and okay. at a time, so, you know, in, in 2008, 2009, they were down to 48%. Okay. They've so, had a steady uh, rise, so, so go from there. So let me just, I, I hadn't seen that, that poll before, but let me just say this, that it's also true, you should show a graph of the percentage of private sector workers that are in unions today. That's down to about 7% or about one out of 13 private sector workers is even a member of a union. So, um, you know, when Joe Biden keeps saying we're going to help working Americans but by being pro-union, yeah, what about the 12 out of 13 workers that are not in unions? Uh, how are they going to be affected by this? That's a very good point. Uh, I want to just play this real quick from a Kellogg worker. Take a listen. 18 months ago, we were considered essential employees. We were called heroes by our CEO. Now, when it's time to just give us and all of us in the union uh, a fair deal, it's not happening. 15 seconds or so, it seems as though that leverage not only is structural and about being able to demand higher wages, but they also sort of have the PR movement on their side too, right? It seems that they do right now. Uh, I will just say this, that oftentimes these higher wages translate into higher prices for for people who actually buy things. So it's for middle class people, it's a double edged sword. You know, in the last jobs report, wages went up by about 4%, which is a good number, except guess what? The consumer price ended up went up by 6%. So in some cases, workers are, as, as Robert Rice was saying, in some cases, workers are falling further behind because of this rising inflation. Hey, Steve, great conversation. Uh, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Okay, thanks, Leila. Right, good to see you. Great week. It's rare for Democrats and Republicans to agree, let alone appear on television together, but that's happening when we come back. Deadlines don't mean a lot in Washington. Congress dodged warnings of Armageddon last week, kicking the debt ceiling can down the road by raising the debt limit $480 billion. In fact, the House just voted on that and passed it. Now, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi setting an October 31st deadline to pass the stalled bipartisan infrastructure bill. If that sounds like deja vu, it's because previous deadlines came and went. Remember, progressives say they won't vote on that until there's a vote on Democrats' much larger tax and spend plan. And after narrowly avoiding a government shutdown this month, a larger battle looms several weeks from now. Here we go. Lawmakers are facing a December 3rd deadline to fund the government moving forward or risk triggering a partial shutdown just in time for the holidays. Stay tuned. 
And Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell is already warning Democrats that Republicans will not agree to raise the debt ceiling yet again in December. This is even a separate vote from the one we just talked about funding the government, blasting what he called Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer's tantrum, where he excoriated Republicans in a floor speech last week ahead of a vote on the short-term debt limit bill. Even fellow Democrat Joe Manchin appeared visibly frustrated with majority leader's comments. But what you're about to see is unusual, perhaps even gives us some hope. Rarely will members of the opposite party agree to appear on television together. But here they are, in living color, two members of the Bipartisan Problem Solvers Caucus, Republican Congressman Brian Fitzpatrick, co-chair of Democratic Congressman Dean Phillips of the great state of Minnesota, who's a member of the caucus um, as well. Gentlemen, uh, good to see you both. Appreciate it. Uh, I guess start, Congressman Phillips, with you. I, for a party that is as divided as you, yours is right now, is it tougher to pro solve the problems across party lines or inside your own party? Well, Leland, the truth is, uh, I think there's actually less division amongst the very human beings that populate Congress than we see on our TV screens. Uh, my friendship and partnership with Brian Fitzpatrick uh, is a perfect example of that. And uh, there's never a time when Congress is entirely unified. Uh, there are those of us, uh, the 29 Democrats, 29 Republicans on the Problem Solvers Caucus, that are simply applying our kindergarten and Sunday school lessons of collegiality and listening to one another and respecting one another and doing what we're sent here to do, which is to solve problems. Uh, there's very little time afforded to researching, collaborating, getting to know each other, no intention amongst leadership on either side of the aisle. Uh, so there's a little less division than you might think, uh, but what you see on TV, of course, is frightening to all, and uh, that's why we're on with you tonight to demonstrate that all is not lost, and uh, there is some hope uh, as long as we populate Congress with people here come, who come here uh, to do their important work. Yeah, well, uh, agreed on, on all fronts. Uh, from my, uh, as a reformed Washingtonian, I have some experience with what you're talking about. Uh, Congressman Fitzpatrick, all right, uh, what problems have you guys solved lately? Because all we've seen out of Washington is dysfunction for the past six or seven months. Uh, basically, everything that's actually gotten across the finish line, Leland, has been a, a product of us. Um, you know, I, I'd say the most significant recent example would be the $908 billion uh, COVID relief package that passed just before the end of last Congress. Uh, when leadership was stalled, leadership, quite frankly, wasn't speaking to each other. Uh, we were the ones that came up with that solution. Most recently, uh, Leland, the, the bipartisan infrastructure bill itself is a product of our caucus. It's a, it was started uh, by our House Problem Solvers Caucus with Dean and I and our leadership. Uh, started in, in, in April of this past year. Uh, it was hatched in Governor Hogan's residence uh, in Annapolis, Maryland. We had Democrat and Republican members of the House, Democrat and Republican members of the Senate, Democrat and Republican governors. And we were the ones that jump-started the stall talks in the White House. And the reason that they'd even passed the Senate, and the senators themselves will tell you this, is because of our caucus. Speaking about the Senate, the world's most deliberative body has perhaps now become one of the world's most angry bodies. And we saw, all saw this video of uh, Chuck Schumer speaking uh, about the debt ceiling and then Joe Manchin putting his hands uh, into his face of sort of saying, almost gobsmocked about <clears throat> how could this, this happen. Uh, I'm wondering, Congressman Phillips, does that... Does Schumer's speech make things easier for you when you're dealing with your house brother on the other no. side of the aisle? No, it makes it harder. And you know, some might say uh, you got to be a gracious winner, but this wasn't Democrats winning. This is a win for the country to uh, prevent what would be a catastrophic uh, problem if it wasn't solved. I think Senator Manchin's gesture uh, spoke for a lot of Americans. Uh, we've had enough of that. Uh, the discord, the mean-spiritedness, uh, on the floor, outside of the floor, on TV. Uh, it's nauseating already. Uh, we're tired of it. I think he spoke for a lot of us, and uh, I'd like to see better behavior from our leaders. All right, Congressman Fitzpatrick, it's your turn now. Here's a soundbite from uh, the former president over the weekend. After just nine months under Biden, violent criminals and bloodthirsty gangs are taking over our streets. Illegal aliens and deadly drug cartels are taking over our borders. Inflation is taking over our economy. And you can't say I didn't warn you. Would it be better for Republicans if President Trump just went down to Mar-a-Lago for the winter and played golf? Would we get more done in Washington? 
Yeah, well, I can tell you, Leland, um, the way that myself and Dean and the members of our caucus uh, engage with one another is very different. Uh, we believe in civility. We, uh, we don't ever attack each other personally. Uh, if we disagree with each other's ideas, uh, we explain what we don't like about that idea and we offer a better alternative. Uh, those are the ground rules we have in our caucus. It's a one-to-one -one ratio. If you want to join, you find someone from the opposite party to join with you. Uh, we sit together in the center of the chamber of the State of the Union address. We do what we call district swaps. Uh, I was in Dean's um, district. Uh, he graciously let me stay in his home uh, in, in uh, beautiful Minneapolis. That's what we believe in, Leland. So every every everybody in, in the public spotlight, whether you be in the media, in elected office, everybody's got their own style. Uh, we, by our definition of our caucus, don't attack anybody for their style. All we try to do is set the example of the right thing to do. You could also, and that's an important message for our country. You, you could also call it the diplomatic caucus uh, with that answer, Congressman. Good. Um, you brought up the media, which I'm interesting that you got to it because this was the speaker of, of the House today talking about the media's role. Take a listen. Do you think you need to do a better job at messaging and going forward, how do you sell this if ultimately you have to Well, I think down? you all could do a better job of selling it, to be very frank with you. Uh, Congressman Phillips, uh, is it our job or our fault that things aren't getting done in D.C.? It's not your job and it's not your fault. Okay. And the truth be, truth be told, uh, the angertainment industry is part of the problem. There's yeah. no question. Uh, I have respect and appreciation for those who deliver the news. Uh, and I have uh, concern about Americans who cannot discern opinion from fact and from news presentations. Uh, we've got to confront that. Uh, but no, it is not your job. Frankly, it's our <clears throat> job. Uh, and uh, I take, uh, take heed from the speaker, of course. Uh, we Democrats certainly can do better in communicating uh, and sending a message. Uh, that is not as confusing, unfortunately, as the one that's being distributed right now vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the reconciliation bill. All right. Um, well, and that's sort of where the debate is going for from there. And that's where I'll leave uh, last words with Congressman Fitzpatrick. Will the, the bipartisan infrastructure bill started, as you said, in the House caucus? Will there be Republicans who vote for it if there's progressives who block it? Yes, there will be, uh, Leland, assuming it's decoupled. I mean, that's been the whole issue, right? Um, this bill passed the Senate, I believe, August 12th. If it would have been put on the floor August 13th, I believe you would have had upwards of 80 Republicans voting for it. <clears throat> that number has significantly diminished as time has gone by. Uh, anytime you have a trillion dollar package out there that's just left out there, um, you, support is going to wane, uh, particularly in the, in, the, in the minority party. So, um, yes, there will be Republican supports, provided it's decoupled. Whether it's over, uh, enough to overcome a progressive defection entirely depends on how many progressives defect. We don't know the answer to that. Um, we do know that we had somewhere between, even as late as the, the vote, the delayed date of September 27th, we still had 15 to 20 Republicans prepared even at that late date to vote for it. Yeah, interesting. Um, interestingly, so yeah, and interestingly enough, even some Republican leadership was uh, whipping against it. Gentlemen, I've quoted my mother once in this show. I'm going to do it again. Some modicum of hope with these guys. That's high praise. We'll leave it there. It's nice to see you guys. Thank you, Lee thank, thank, thank you both. The governor of one state now banning vaccine mandates altogether. He's the second governor to do that. Yeah, is it really going to make a difference, especially with what he's talking about in airlines? Maybe it's more about politics for Governor Greg Abbott. We'll dig in when we come back. What's the White House response to people who say vaccine mandates have um, reduced the workforce and contributed to this problem? Well, I know uh, world-renowned um, business, travel, and health expert Senator Ted Cruz has made that point, but um, I wouldn't say that that is widely um, uh, acknowledged or echoed uh, by um, business leaders who have implemented these mandates. Yeah, well, the governor of Texas says, well, there will not be mandates in his state. You just heard the White House mocking the idea that vaccine mandates are leading to worker shortages. Governor Abbott has said no mandates under any condition. Greg Abbott signed an executive order banning them altogether. The timing's interesting, especially given the recent delays with Southwest, which is based in Dallas. The company insists the issues have nothing to do with pilots not wanting to get the vaccine, but apparently 
It doesn't really matter. Southwest announced today that it will comply with President Biden's vaccine mandate rather than the governor's ban. However, the CEO of Southwest says he doesn't like the mandate, nor does the pilot's union for that matter. Jessica Montoya Coggins features an opinion editor for the Texas Signal. Josh Blackman teaches constitutional law at South Texas College of Law in Houston. Appreciate you both being here. Uh, Jessica, stand by one second. Josh, real quick. Uh, federal law, no pun intended, Trump state law, correct? Exactly. In any conflict between federal law and state law, the federal law prevails. Um, but in the present moment, we don't actually have a federal mandate. Biden announced a policy a month ago. I'm just going to, I don't, I don't ever want to argue with a lawyer, but we do have a mandate for government contractors, which is what Southwest and American Airlines are, though, right? Right. So for the airlines in particular, they have a policy in effect immediately. So there is a conflict there. Okay. Uh, Jessica, to that end, it's pretty clear uh, based on what Josh has said and any other lawyer you talk to, for that matter, that the governor's order is pretty much meaningless. What's the political calculation? Is this about running for president or getting more interviews or what's his deal? Well, certainly, I do think Abbott has uh, 2024 ambitions. Uh, but before that, he is up for re-election. And he actually has uh, several Republican primary challengers, one of them a former Republican state senator, Don Huffines. Uh, he had challenged Abbott about any sort of vaccine mandate in the state. And he essentially took a victory lap after this new executive order from Abbott uh, banning any entity in Texas from implementing a vaccine mandate, including private businesses. So, Josh, how does this play out? A private business puts on a vaccine mandate, then an employee challenges it in the, the how, where does this go? It's messy. The Texas Attorney General would actually be able to challenge the employer mandate in court. Um, it gets even worse. The law, I'm sorry, the order applies to a Texas entity. Could that be, say, Google or Facebook, which is not an airline, but employs people in Texas? A California company may have a mandate in place under state law. Um, so this creates a lot of confusion. It's still not clear how, how this will actually be enforced. So, Gabby, uh, in other words, there's a, a, a win for Governor Abbott simply in the fight, is his view. Jessica? Yes, yes, I, I think that is correct. Um, you know, this is essentially sort of a, a piece of red meat that he can throw to the base, uh, one that is very powerful in Texas, even if about 65% of Texans actually support a vaccine mandate in some capacity, whether that's federal, state, or local. That's interesting. So it's 65% support actually a mandate Where's, versus just support getting vaccinated. Sure. Yeah, that comes from the COVID-19 states project. Uh, so that was actually, I think, probably surprising for folks. I think it was upwards about 70 percent of Texans are in favor of a vaccine requirement for airline flights. Um, but, you know, there's also polling that shows Abbott is underwater. These are tough times for him uh, in Texas. A majority of Texans right now are, uh, do not support the way he has handled COVID-19. You have to remember in our state, the Delta variant uh, was, was very detrimental these last couple of months, and it was uh, very harrowing for, for many places. Yeah, we've certainly seen over time that where, when you get this spike uh, in the beginning, everybody loves the freedoms, then as deaths go up, popularity of whoever allowed the freedoms goes down, and then popularity of whoever allows the freedoms go back up just in that wave. Um, Polling comes into this in so many different ways. Uh, reason for getting vaccinated, 67% incentives or fear of the virus, only 8% because of the mandates. Uh, Professor, I'm wondering, uh, does, does the public opinion play in at all once this gets to court about how effective they are or whether they serve a purpose? Well, I think this executive order is for litigation purposes. Um, eventually, Biden will impose his federal mandate but it's not by statute, it's by an executive order. And I think Texas will argue, see, you have the president overreaching into an area the states are trying to regulate on their own. So I think it weakens Biden's case for federal power mm -hmm. and the states are enacting these sorts of policies on, in their, on their own right. That's fascinating. And uh, that's why we have a constitutional professor on uh, to talk about this. Jessica Montoya Coggins uh, with us as well. Great perspective from you both, we appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Leland. All right, new details in the missing case of Gabby Petito. We understand how she was murdered, what that might say about where her boyfriend is when we come back.
Our initial determination is the body uh, was in the wilderness for three to four weeks. That was the Teton County coroner who revealed new information today about Gabby Petito's autopsy and her cause of death. She was strangled. Her boyfriend, Brian Laundry, still remains on the run. News Nation's Brian Ennis has been on the trail of this case since the very beginning when she was reported missing. Joins us now from outside the boyfriend's parents' home in Northport, Florida. Brian, other than the strangulation part of this, what stuck out to you? Well, Leland, you know, so many people suspected that this would be the cause of death, but to hear the coroner say it today and then to see it in black and white in the official report, which we just got a little while ago, signed off by the coroner, I mean, it's heavy stuff. The, the official cause of death is death by manual strangulation slash throttling. So you have to imagine what, what Gabby was going through um, at, at the end of her life. And the other big headline from, uh, from the coroner's news conference today was he said uh, that she died three to four weeks before her body was discovered. Listen to the Teton County coroner. Uh, I can tell you the DNA samples were taken by law enforcement. Uh, so that was quick there, but basically he was saying that uh, that they did take DNA. There's a lot going on behind the scenes. They're also doing toxicology, but because of the FBI investigation, the coroner would really only give the official cause of death and then give that other uh, tidbit about how long they think the body was there. Leland? As I heard it, he said samples, which conceivably would mean more than one. Uh, it feels as though if the body's been there for three or four weeks, this is setting up this classic case of, the boyfriend saying, look, I left her, and yeah, I maybe shouldn't have left her, but we got into a fight, I left, and then something terrible happened to her afterwards, and if in three or four weeks after passing away there was someone else's DNA found on her, that, that's reasonable doubt for any jury, right? It's possible. It's interesting that he brought up the DNA. Again, he wouldn't elaborate, but being here outside the house for a month, we've seen the FBI come to this house two times behind me uh, to get items to collect DNA, items of Brian Laundry. So there's surely testing going on behind the scenes. Uh, the the uh, FBI refers to Brian Laundry as a fugitive. We know he's technically a person of interest in the case, but at this point, he's still only wanted on those bank fraud charges. Yeah, the bank fraud charges relate to using her credit card and other items after uh, clearly they had separated and now after we know uh, that she passed away and for actually we no longer have to say passed away we can say that she was murdered and strangled to death. Brian great reporting as always we'll talk to you soon. Thanks Leland. More on the NFL tomorrow Dan Abrams is next.